Part four, chapter eleven of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four, a voyage to the country of the Hwinnams. Chapter eleven. The author's dangerous voyage. He arrives at New Holland, hoping to settle there, is wounded with an arrow by one of the natives, is seized and carried by force into a Portuguese ship, the great civilities of the captain, the author arrives at England. I began this desperate voyage on February 15th, 1714-15, at nine o'clock in the morning. The wind was very favourable, However, I made use at first only of my paddles, but, considering I should soon be weary, and that the wind might chop about, I ventured to set up my little sail, and thus, with the help of the tide, I went at the rate of a league and a half an hour, as near as I could guess. My master and his friends continued on the shore till I was almost out of sight, and I often heard the sorrel nag, who always loved me, crying out, Hanya ilya nea maja yahoo. Take care of thyself, gentle yahoo. My design was, if possible, to discover some small island uninhabited, yet sufficient by my labour, to furnish me with the necessaries of life, which I would have thought a greater happiness than to be first minister in the politest court of Europe. So horrible was the idea I conceived of returning to live in society and under the government of Yahoos. For in such a solitude as I desired, I could at least enjoy my own thoughts, and reflect with delight on the virtues of those inimitable Houinams. Without an opportunity of degenerating into the vices and corruptions of my own species. The reader may remember what I related when my crew conspired against me and confined me to my cabin. How I continued there several weeks, without knowing what course we took, and when I was put ashore in the long-boat, how the sailors told me with oaths, whether true or false, that they knew not in what part of the world we were. However, I did then believe us to be about ten degrees southward of the Cape of Good Hope, or about forty-five degrees southern latitude, as I gathered from some general words I overheard among them, being, I suppose, to the south-east in their intended voyage to Madagascar. And although this was little better than conjecture, yet I resolved to steer my course eastward, hoping to reach the south-west coast of New Holland, and perhaps some such island as I desired lying westward of it. The wind was full west, and by six in the evening I computed I had gone eastward at least eighteen leagues, when I spied a very small island about half a league off, which I soon reached. It was nothing but a rock, with one creek naturally arched by the force of tempests. Here I put in my canoe, and climbing a part of the rock, I could plainly discover land to the east, extending from south to north. I lay all night in my canoe, and repeating my voyage early in the next morning, I arrived in seven hours to the south-east point of New Holland. This confirmed me in the opinion I have long entertained, that the maps and charts place this country at least three degrees more to the east than it really is, which thought I communicated many years ago to my worthy friend Mr. Herman Mole, and gave him my reasons for it although he has rather chosen to follow other authors. I saw no inhabitants in the place where I landed, and, being unarmed, I was afraid of venturing far into the country. I found some shellfish on the shore, and ate them raw, not daring to kindle a fire, for fear of being discovered by the natives. I continued three days feeding on oysters and limpets, to save my own provisions and I fortunately found a brook of excellent water, which gave me great relief. On the fourth day, venturing out early a little too far, I saw twenty or thirty natives upon a height not above five hundred yards from me. They were stark naked, men, women, and children, 
round a fire, as I could discover by the smoke. One of them spied me, and gave notice to the rest. Five of them advanced towards me, leaving the women and children at the fire. I made what haste I could to the shore, and getting into my canoe, shoved off. The savages, observing me retreat, ran after me, and before I could get far enough into the sea, discharged an arrow which wounded me deeply on the inside of my left knee. I shall carry the mark to my grave. I apprehended the arrow might be poisoned, and paddling out of reach of their darts, being a calm day, I made a shift to suck the wound and dress it as well as I could. I was at a loss what to do, for I durst not return to the same landing-place, but stood to the north, and was forced to paddle, for the wind, though very gentle, was against me, blowing north-west. As I was looking about for a secure landing-place, I saw a sail to the north-north-east, which, appearing every minute more visible, I was in some doubt whether I should wait for them or not. But, at last, my detestation of the Yahoo race prevailed, and turning my canoe I sailed and paddled together to the south, and got into the same creek whence I set out in the morning, choosing rather to trust myself among these barbarians than live with the European Yahoos. I drew up my canoe as close as I could to the shore, and hid myself behind a stone by the little brook, which, as I have already said, was excellent water. The ship came within half a league of this creek, and sent a long boat with vessels to take in fresh water, for the place, it seems, was very well known. But I did not observe it till the boat was almost on shore, and it was too late to seek another hiding place. The seamen at their landing observed my canoe, and rummaging it all over, easily conjectured that the owner could not be far off. Four of them, well armed, searched every cranny and lurking hole, till at last they found me flat on my face behind the stone. They gazed a while in admiration at my strange, uncouth dress, my coat made of skins, my wooden-soled shoes, and my furred stockings. Whence, however, they concluded, I was not a native of the place, who all go naked. One of the seamen, in Portuguese, bid me rise, and asked who I was. I understood that language very well, and getting upon my feet, said, I was a poor Yahoo, banished from the Whinhams, and desired they would please to let me depart. They admired to hear me answer them in their own tongue, and saw by my complexion I must be a European, but were at a loss to know what I meant by Yahoos and Whinhams and at the same time fell a-laughing at my strange tone in speaking, which resembled the neighing of a horse. I trembled all the while betwixt fear and hatred. I again desired leave to depart, and was gently moving to my canoe, but they laid hold of me, desiring to know what country I was of, whence I came, with many other questions. I told them I was born in England, whence I came about five years ago, and then their country and ours were at peace. I therefore hoped they would not treat me as an enemy, since I meant them no harm, but was a poor Yahoo seeking some desolate place where to pass the remainder of his unfortunate life. When they began to talk, I thought I never heard or saw anything more unnatural for it appeared to me as monstrous as if a dog or a cow should speak in England, or a yahoo in Whinhamland. The honest Portuguese were equally amazed at my strange dress, and the odd manner of delivering my words, which, however, they understood very well. They spoke to me with great humanity, and said, They were sure the captain would carry me gratis to Lisbon, whence I might return to my own country that two of the seamen would go back to the ship, inform the captain of what they had seen, and receive his orders. In the meantime, unless I would give my solemn oath not to fly, they would secure me by force. I thought it best to comply with their proposal, 
They were very curious to know my story, but I gave them very little satisfaction, and they all conjectured that my misfortunes had impaired my reason. In two hours the boat, which was laden with vessels of water, returned, with the captain's command to fetch me on board. I fell on my knees to preserve my liberty, but all was in vain, and the men, having tied me with cords, heaved me into the boat, whence I was taken into the ship, and thence into the captain's cabin. His name was Pedro de Mendez. He was a very courteous and generous person. He entreated me to give some account of myself, and desired to know what I would eat or drink, said, I should be used as well as himself and spoke so many obliging things, that I wondered to find such civilities from a yahoo. However, I remained silent and sullen. I was ready to faint at the very smell of him and his men. At last I desired something to eat out of my own canoe, but he ordered me a chicken and some excellent wine, and then directed I should be put to bed in a very clean cabin. I would not undress myself, but lay on the bedclothes, and in half an hour stole out, when I thought the crew was at dinner, and getting to the side of the ship, was going to leap into the sea and swim for my life, rather than continue among the yahoos. But one of the seamen prevented me, and having informed the captain, I was chained to my cabin. After dinner, Don Pedro came to me, and desired to know my reason for so desperate an attempt. Assured me, he only meant to do me all the service he was able, and spoke so very movingly, that at last I descended to treat him like an animal which had some little portion of reason. I gave him a very short relation of my voyage, of the conspiracy against me by my own men, of the country where they set me on shore, and my five years of residence there all which he looked upon as if it were a dream or a vision, whereat I took great offence, for I had quite forgot the faculty of lying, so peculiar to yahoos, in all the countries where they preside, and, consequently, their disposition of suspecting truth in others of their own species. I asked him whether it were the custom in his country to say the thing which was not. I assured him I had almost forgot what he meant by falsehood, and if I had lived a thousand years in Huynham land, I should never have heard a lie from the meanest servant, that I was altogether indifferent whether he believed me or not, but, however, in return for his favours, I would give so much allowance to the corruption of his nature, as to answer any objection he would please to make, and then he might easily discover the truth. The captain, a wise man, after many endeavours to catch me tripping in some part of my story, at last began to have a better opinion of my veracity. But he added, that, since I professed so inviolable an attachment to truth, I must give him my word and honour to bear him company in this voyage, without attempting anything against my life, or else he would continue me as a prisoner till we arrived at Lisbon. I gave him the promise he required, but at the same time protested that I would suffer the greatest hardships rather than return to live among the yahoos. Our voyage passed without any considerable accident. In gratitude to the captain, I sometimes sat with him in his earnest request, and strove to conceal my antipathy against humankind, although it often broke out, which he suffered to pass without observation. But the greatest part of the day I confined myself to my cabin, to avoid seeing any of the crew. The captain had often entreated me to strip myself of my savage dress, and offered to lend me the best suit of clothes he had. This I would not be prevailed on to accept, abhorring to cover myself with anything that had been on the back of a yahoo. I only desired he would lend me two clean shirts which, having been washed since he wore them, I believed would not so much defile me. These I changed every second day, and washed them myself. We arrived at Lisbon, November 5th, 1715. At our landing the captain forced me to cover myself with his cloak, 
to prevent the rabble from crowding about me. I was conveyed to his own house, and, at my earnest request, he led me up to the highest room backwards. I conjured him to conceal from all persons what I had told him of the Whinnons, because the least hint of such a story would not only draw numbers of people to see me, but probably put me in danger of being imprisoned or burnt by the Inquisition. The captain persuaded me to accept a suit of clothes newly made, but I would not suffer the tailor to take my measure. However, Don Pedro, being almost of my size, they fitted me well enough. He accoutred me with other necessaries, all new, which I aired for twenty-four hours before I would use them. The captain had no wife, nor above three servants, none of which were suffered to attend at meals, and his whole deportment was so obliging, added to a very good human understanding, that I really began to tolerate his company. He gained so far upon me, that I ventured to look out of the back window. By degrees I was brought into another room, whence I peeped into the street, but drew my head back in a fright. In a week's time he seduced me down to the door. I found my terror gradually lessened, but my hatred and contempt seemed to increase. I was at last bold enough to walk the street in his company, but kept my nose well stopped with rue or sometimes with tobacco. In ten days Don Pedro, to whom I had given some account of my domestic affairs, put it upon me, as a matter of honour and conscience, that I ought to return to my native country, and live at home with my wife and children. He told me, there was an English ship in the port just ready to sail, and he would furnish me with all things necessary. It would be tedious to repeat his arguments and my contradictions. He said, it was altogether impossible to find such a solitary island as I desired to live in, but I might command in my own house, and pass my time in a manner as recluse as I pleased. I complied at last, finding I could not do better. I left Lisbon the twenty-fourth day of November, in an English merchantman, but who was the master I never inquired. Don Pedro accompanied me to the ship, and lent me twenty pounds. He took kind leave of me, and embraced me at a parting, which I bore as well as I could. During this last voyage I had no commerce with the master or any of his men, but, pretending I was sick, kept clothes in my cabin. On the 5th of December, 1715, we cast anchor in the Downs, about nine in the morning, and, at three in the afternoon, I got safe to my house at Rotherheath. My wife and family received me with great surprise and joy, because they concluded me certainly dead. But, I must freely confess, the sight of them filled me only with hatred, disgust, and contempt, and the more by reflecting on the near alliance I had to them. For although, since my unfortunate exile from the Wynnum country, I had compelled myself to tolerate the sight of Yahoos, and to converse with Don Pedro de Mendez, yet my memory and imagination were perpetually filled with the virtues and ideas of those exalted Wynnums. And when I began to consider that, by copulating with one of the Yahoo species, I had become a parent of more, it struck me with the utmost shame, confusion, and horror. As soon as I entered the house, my wife took me in her arms and kissed me, at which, having not been used to the touch of that odious animal for so many years, I fell into a swoon for almost an hour. At the time I am writing, it is five years since my last return to England. During the first year I could not endure my wife or children in my presence. The very smell of them was intolerable. Much less could I suffer them to eat in the same room. To this hour they dare not presume to touch my bread, or drink out of the same cup. Neither was I ever able to let one of them take me by the hand. The first money I laid out was to buy two young stone horses, which I keep in a good stable, and next to them the groom is my greatest favourite. 
for I feel my spirits revived by the smell he contracts in the stables. My horses understand me tolerably well. I converse with them at least four hours every day. They are strangers to bridle or saddle. They live in great amity with me and friendship to each other. End of part four, chapter eleven.